and the airways lapsed into silence. In 1921, all you could hear was monotonous Morse code of military, commercial, marine traffic. The radio amateurs, the dear old hams, remember Tony Hancock, that's the whole armful. Well, they'd come into the fore, they'd already started to form societies, 63 radio societies would become the Radio Society of Great Britain. They lobbied, petitioned, and generally made Kellaway's life a nightmare. They wanted radio broadcast, they wanted it now. In January 1922, they basically said, OK, they'll relent and allow one scheduled, advertised radio station to come online. They went to the Marconi company and said, please do it. And they went, no. <laughs> Everything's gone back to Ireland. We're not really interested. But Burroughs picked it up and went, actually, out at, in the small village of Rittle, about two and a half miles outside Chelmsford, uh, we have a small team of maverick engineers run by Peter Eckersley. They're the Airborne Wireless Development Team. Directly descended from the Royal Flying Corps Royal Air Team that developed speech radio. And they've carried on building the radio for air traffic control and direction finding and weather information and traffic information. They're really busy. By 1922, those engineers, Eckersley, Kirk, Wynne, Ashbridge probably knew more about speech radio than anybody else in the world. A licence was granted to the Marconis with less than two weeks' notice. This sounds familiar. Arthur Burroughs walks into Peter Eckersley's hut. They haven't even got mains electricity. It's just a generator. There is no toilet there. It's up to a horn speaker. They get to the pub for anything else. One stove heating the hut and said, Peter, we want you to do this thing called broadcasting. Eckersley smoked his pipe and looked at him and went, are you mad? That's Chelmsford's job. No, Chelmsford can't do it. It's up to you. And he goes, what is it? What do you want? And Burroughs went, we don't know. Make it up. But for a time, we've got a wind-up ground phone from the Chapel Wireless Company. I'm going to select a bunch of records. All you have to do is introduce them, play them, shut down every three minutes in case you're interfering with legitimate sources. Don't transmit with more than 400 watts into your little area outside, 110-foot high masts, ex bore war. One night a week... After hours, you don't get any extra pay. Any equipment you use has to be returned to normal use. And any expenses, if you want to bring a singer in, has to be paid out of your own pocket. Exley said, and this is a good deal. And that is the birth of British broadcasting. A little hut in a partly flooded field in the little village of Rittle. Its call sign, which was just another amateur radio call sign, another professional radio call sign, was 2MT. Today we call it 2 Mike Tango. But Eckersley was ex-Flying Corps, and they used a different phonetic alphabet. So in their language, it was to Emma Tock. On St. Valentine's Day night, 14th of February 1922, a weak, static-laden voice echoed out from the Rittle hut. And it was, hello, CQ, this is to Emma Tock Rittle testing. This is to Emma Tock Rittle calling. And the world changes. Hello, CQ, hello, CQ. This is 2 Emma Talk, Rittle testing. This is 2 Emma Talk, Rittle testing. Hello, CQ. Hello. Hello, Ash. Hello, Ash. Ash, hello. Are the signals OK? No, they're not. Wave your hand if it's all OK. No waves? No waves at all. Curse. Kirk, is that all right in there? Kirk! No, not? Sorry, sorry. Well, sorry, CQ. Closing down a moment. Hello, CQ. Hello, CQ. This is 2 Emma Talk, Rittle testing. This is 2 Emma Talk, Rittle testing. Tonight, we have a most marvellous thing that's going to happen. We are going to receive Rome, that famous Italian tenor, that famous Italian tenor, what's his name? Gridlico is going to sing Non Puto Pirore Pantissimo, which being translated means, um, it's very difficult. CQ, the concert's ended. Sad wails the heterodyne. You must soon switch off your valves. I must soon switch off mine. Now we're going to receive it. There may be some atmospherics. There may be some... There may be some jamming. Bah, 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 bah. There may be some oscillation. Whew! But hang on, CQ. We're just going to receive it now. Hang on, CQ. Hang on, CQ. Here it is.
So for a while they've just been saying, you'll now hear a record entitled. You've just heard a record entitled. Some radio stations we know are like that. We're now shutting down. You've just heard. By the chapel piano company's wine up gramophone. Commercial radio in 1922, even then. Eckersley swept it all the way. He said, no, I'm not doing this. Half an hour's not long enough. I'm not shutting down for three minutes. I'm going to do what I want to do. And when Eckersley stepped to the microphone, he had several skills. First thing was, he was a storyteller. He told jokes. He told very blue jokes in 1920. He was politically incorrect. Uh, in his first broadcast, he insulted the politicians, the Icelandic government, and all the directors of the um, Great Eastern Train Service. So they all requested that he get sacked. He didn't care. He just carried on for hour after hour talking. And he had this ability to look at the microphone, talk to the microphone as if he was in the front room with his listeners. They called him his friends. Hello, friends. Never been done before. He's the first disc jockey, the first comedian, the first raconteur. And what he did in the summer of 1922 shapes and forms radio for the next 70, 80 years. In that summer, they define everything. The first stage play, the first children's hour, the first special effects, the first quiz, the first Lonely Hearts Club, all comes out of Riddle. Special effects, we all think Monty Python banged coconuts together. No, Riddle. Sandpaper, slamming doors, first time to be transmitted on radio, just because it was interesting. Um, Piano's out of tune. He loved Strange Noise. He'd play a 78 RPM gramophone record at 45 with the hole drilled off centre. And then he spread marmalade on it because it sounded interesting. He'd tell everybody what he was doing. This is The Goon Show in 1922. We weren't uh, simply and only interested in um, broadcasting this frivolous stuff that you might think that we did. We had serious artists. For instance, we had Melchior. Well, Melchior had just been married, apparently, and he'd left his wife comforted by a crystal set in Denmark, and he believed that the louder he uh, sang, the more likely his wife, uh, his new wife, was to hear him. And um, so when the opening bars were played, he sucked in his breath, which pulled the windows shut, and he gave a bellow that shut the station down. And uh, I remember afterwards, he used to wander about the place and say, uh, what's that? Bust component there. Oh, well, of course, that's part of the Melchior breakdown. That is, uh, yes, I got that thing burst into flame. A raconteur wit, he becomes one of the most famous people in England overnight. The Port of Liverpool shuts when Rittle is on air at 7.20. The House of Commons goes down so they can all listen to the radio. It's estimated he probably had half a million listeners by the end of the summer of... And 52 companies apply for radio stations to copy Eccles because they suddenly realise he's so popular you can sell anything behind it. And of course it's still the Marconi brand is still going out there. It's Marconi Station. This is Marconi to him atop Riddle testing. Uh, it was quite clear who they were and what they were and a lot of companies didn't like that because they said, hold on, this is mass entertainment, mass advertising, however surreptitious it might be. The... Government, bless them, decided that they could not have the chaos that arrived in America. After much head-scratching, many meetings, much consultation, they decided they needed a single company to control broadcasting in Britain. And what they do is they call it the British Broadcasting Company. Because they always said that, but it must take them a long time to come up with. 